Okay, today is June the 15th, 2022, and this is our Wednesday's Bible study. This will be the second edition, second edition of Elijah, J-A-H-S, Elijah's Drought. And today, Derek will bring the reading. So whenever you're ready, son. All right, the reading is going to be in Haggai, uh, all of chapter one. It's only 15 verses. And just for the sake of uh, like understanding where this fits, so Haggai comes right after um, they Israel gets out of the Babylon Babylonian captivity, and they're right under the Persian captivity. So there's not much of a break here. But um, so I, this reading is just to kind of build upon the foundation that we've been talking about over. Elijah with like his boldness and his faith and just seeing another prophet kind of do the things that God had ordained him to do. So um, in the second year of Darius, the king in the sixth month, in the first day of the month came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shel Shelti, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, It is time for you, O ye, to dwell in your siled houses, and this house lie waste. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways, ye have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, but you have not, brought, um, you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus said the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, said the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why? Say the Lord of hosts. Because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of uh, Shaltai, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people obeyed. The voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, said the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shal Shalti, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. In the four and twentieth day of the sixth month and the second year of Darius the king. Um, so a couple things I'll point out um, in this is um, that one God is telling them that the time is not come. And we've seen this like in a couple other instances throughout the Bible, like with David, um, when they're trying to build a temple, that he's not in a position to actually do it right. Mm -hmm. And so he's looking for his messenger and his per uh, his person that's going to put the people in a position to obey God to his standard before he gives them a house that they can dwell in, right? Because we're not, you can't be unclean living and dwelling in the house of God. So he's trying to get the people correct, right? Um, and so he says in verse um, five, now therefore, thus said the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And if you read the rest of Haggai, there's only two chapters, but he says this, consider your ways like five times. So he's, again, he's trying to get the people to understand like what they're doing, their actions, and 
the ramifications of those things. And he goes into verse six where he says, you've sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. So all these things that they're doing physically um, are not edifying them. They're, they're for vain, right? He says, like, if you are earned wages, but you put it in a bag with holes. So, like, what is the purpose of all these things you're doing? And he says, consider your ways again in verse 7. And then he gives them instructions about how to build this house and that I'm going to bring uh, be glorified bump, um, from this. And then he says, um, where he says that? In verse 9, um, you did you build a home on your own, um, but I blew upon it. And to me, I just, that's, again, like that's the fact that they're in captivity yet again, right? I'm trying you again to see what type of foundation you have on is or is this um is this house that you built going to stand and then he says um because you're you're lying my house to waste and you're turning everyone back to its own house so you're not bringing people in for my glory you're just kind of spreading my flock right and then he says um in verse 10 and 11 so this is where he gets into the drought and he's he says that i'm gonna remove the uh, call for a drought of new wine, corn, uh, upon the oil, all these things. Uh, he even says, like, upon the cattle and upon the labor of the hands. So and you read that, like, spiritually, there's a lot of spiritual aspects in this, like the wine, the oil. So the spirit, the, he says, the dew. So you're going to be stayed from your um, your fruits. So you're no longer going to be able to produce because you don't have my gifts. You don't have my truth. You don't have my word, right? So your land's going to start to fall apart but also spiritually you're not going to be able to withstand that and then he moves down he it the words um i they kind of convict right they convict the high priests and mm. um they convict the the governor here um and it says at the end of verse 12 there um as the lord god as the lord their god had sent them and the people did fear before the lord so understand the bible talks about fear being the beginning of knowledge and so once they had this fear then that's when they started to prosper right and that was the whole point of Haggai's message here so that's all i have for this good very good another another man of god another prophet uh calling and stepping into the gap uh where uh things have not gone the way God would have his people uh, to take them, uh, setting back, being comfortable where they're at. I think that's uh, a lot of where we're at today, just sitting in the church and being comfortable with the fact that we think we're saved, right? Uh, our life is good and we're using our life condition in the flesh to determine our position spiritually. And when you do that, if you're utilizing your condition in the flesh to determine your spirit, you're more than likely going to misjudge where you're at spiritually. So, um, again, it's not the flesh that we fight. It's uh, spirits and principalities in high places. And we have to be in the word of God so the spirit can be in us to fight against those principalities in high places. Uh, anybody else, anything else that stand out in the reading today that Derek read to us? Good job, son. Yes. I, I, I pick it up from uh, verse 12 okay. and carry it out. And it says, then uh, Zerba, the son of Shia, and Joshua, the son of Hoset, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord of their God and the words of Haggai, uh, the prophet, as the Lord their God has sent you, and the people did fear before God. So to me, uh, what he's saying is that once you come into the fear of God, fear of God, which is basically the beginning of knowledge, mm -hmm. and also with the beginning of knowledge and accepting God for who he really is, and then once you start, once you accept him for who he really is, and then you can accept the, the, the voice, which is the prophet that's speaking to you as the word coming directly from God. And so as you, as, as you start to 
to understand and you start to obey. And the fear is not like a fear of being scared. It's a, it's, it's a, a healthy respect. And so yeah. once you once you gain that that respect and understanding and knowing who God, he's the one and only, and that he has his prophet. And so when you hear those words, and then it's like when God steps into it, when, when you start humbling yourself and start realizing that he is God, then he stirs the spirit. And as he stirs the spirit, then things will start to happen. And, and you can you you can start to do and understand and see what it is that God has the 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 uh you can say the the work that you need to do. And mm -hmm. so and so as you as you start understanding the work and God stirs the spirit, then it's like then uh, uh, God can bless things and then things can start to take place as the way God wanted. There you go. Yeah, o obedience. You, you picked up a whole lot of things in there, but the thing that stood out to me was, um, the two things that stood out to me that you, you've mentioned to us was the fear first uh, bringing you um, to a point where you're willing to move, right? Take action as we say a lot of times, Derek, especially work. Uh, there's work to be done. And the issue is no one wants to work. They're happy with just being called the people of God, right? And I'm just giving you an overall perspective of what Haggai was dealing with here. Uh, they're happy. God has blessed them. They're in the land of milk and honey. Everything is good. And as Derek stated, even though they had come out of Babylon, uh, now they're under the Medo-Persian Empire, but they've been so used to being under the flesh that they're comfortable being under the flesh. And I believe we're the same way in the church. We get comfortable being under the flesh. So we just stay there, we sit there and we're waiting. We're waiting, we're waiting. And my question to those who are listening to this Bible study or that will hear this Bible study is, what are you waiting on? To be raptured? Like most of the people in the church? Why are we waiting to be raptured when there's work to be done? What is going to stir up the spirit in the church for the church to go to work? Look at the earth. Look at the garden. Look at the trees. Do they not need pruning? Do they not need fertilizer, which is the word of God? Do they not need rain, water? I mean, I'm not just talking about in the building. I'm talking about at your work. I'm talking about in your home. I'm talking about in your family. I'm talking about in your extended family. What are we waiting on? Because every generation has waited and waited and waited. And that generation has gone and passed, and now they're in the ground waiting. When are the people of God going to get up and move in the power and the spirit of these prophets that we're reading about and do something? In this case, build a temple. The thing that stood out to me also was verse 2. Let's speak of the Lord of hosts, saying, these people say the time has not come. That's why God didn't let you do anything. He's judging your heart. He's judging your mind. You don't want to do anything. You're content not doing anything. So when we ask, why is the country going to hell in a handbasket? There's your answer. These people don't want to do anything. And, and God works from the perspective of, if you have a heart to work for God and do for God, he's going to bless you to be able to accomplish that thing you want to accomplish for God. Amen. But if we have a heart to just sit back and wait to be raptured, and then we're going to throw a party in the air with Jesus, wow. Jesus didn't even do that himself. He worked. He saved the, he saved the dead from, from death, physically and spiritually. He healed the sick. Amen. He preached the word of God, the truth. He followed the commandments. Went into the synagogue every Sabbath and preached the truth against the bad doctrine that was in there. That's why they killed him. But two, these people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. 
The prophets didn't say that. The prophet said his work to be done. Time to go to work. And then we get to four. We get a question. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lay waste? That's where I'm getting. We're comfortable. We're able to tithe 10%. We're able to drive two cars. We're able to have a nice home. We're able to buy and eat and go out to eat after church on Sunday, go after eat to eat after payday on Friday. And we don't even think about the Sabbath or anything else. All we do is sit back and wait to be raptured. That's a powerful church, isn't it? I just hope that uh, one of these generations, God willing, I'll be able to see them wake up and get uh, motivated and move spiritually in the heart for Christ and go to work. Amen. All right. Anybody else have anything? All right. I'm going to get off my soapbox and let's pray and then we'll go to the review and then we'll get back to the outline. Father God, we thank you that we're able to come together. Lord, help us not to be lazy and help us not to be content with uh, just going to church, being baptized and coming out of the water and sitting there waiting for you to rapture us. Help us to go to work. Help us to uh, build the temple of God, the church of God. Lord, help us to go to people and with hope, uh, with the fear of God and the mind of Jesus. As uh, the Bible says, let this mind that was in him be in you also. Help us to be able to willing to sacrifice ourselves for the good of the church and the good of the, the, the saints and the souls of the people that are in the world, that are in the garden, Lord. Help us to restore the garden as uh, you would have it to be, Lord. And help us to continue to learn and understand your word and your truth as we continue to work, Lord. And these things we pray in your name, Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. All right, let's go back to First Kings and look at First Kings for the review. We'll pick up in First Kings. I'm going to give you a couple of words in First Kings first. Uh, if you have a pen and piece of paper, a couple of things that are going to come up uh, in, in the word. Uh, first, uh, I want to give you the brook Cherith. Um, let's go to First Kings and look at that real quick uh, and give you what the biblical definition of that so you can have understanding as we, as we get there to read this to us because it's important that we know why these words are there. So we're in First Kings 17 for the review. And if you go to verse 3, almost at the bottom there, underline Brook Cherith. Brook Cherith means to cut off or to cut down. Brook Cherith. We hear the, the word Jordan River a lot, and we see that right there uh, next to the Brook Cherith that is before the Jordan. That's the Jordan River. So we know the Jordan River, we know where it's at over by Israel, but we read over it, we don't really have understanding. The Jordan River biblically means a boundary and a crossing point. It's a metaphor for spiritual rebirth or salvation. I want to give you that so you'll have that when you go back and study, apply those definitions to those words, and we can have more understanding then we see the word ravens. The ravens came and fed uh, Elijah. And, and Derek asked this question at one of the Bible studies. And the ravens can mean ravens. In most uh, places we see it as ravens or birds. But in the Hebrew, the raven also means Arabs. Remember, Ishmael was from um, Ishmael and Isaac were both from the same father. They both came out of Abraham. One became the Arabs. And a lot of times in theology, we see that word raven. It also means the Arabs. So we don't know whether it was actually birds. A lot of people like to think of that spiritually, God moving the birds to actually feed him, or whether it was of the seed of Ishmael, the people of Ishmael, uh, the Arabs that were in the deserts where, where he went to uh, that fed him. So just want to give you that for your understanding. And the last word I want to give you all that we don't see a lot of is in verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath. Zarephath is a place, but in the Hebrew, the word itself means a smelting place or a workshop for refining. Think about that a workshop for refining. God is always refining his prophets. 
Just because you're going through trials and tribulations doesn't mean that God is not with you. He's taking you sometimes through those trials and tribulations to refine you, amen, and me. So we just got to understand those things as we read through this. And take time, if you will, when you do the study to, to apply those definitions, God willing to those words as you read it. That being said, let's get to it. Let's do the outline uh, and start in the review. Derek, can you read to us 1 through 16? And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the book Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, go thee, Zarephath, which belonged to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he rose and went to Zarephath, and he went, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water and a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil, and a curse, and behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus said the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of mill shall not waste, neither shall the curse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the curse of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Amen. Thank you, son. A lot of, a lot of things going on here, but this is, again, the first time Elijah shows up in the book. And the first thing he does is go to a king and queen of what was supposed to be God's people. Ahab was supposed to be the king of Israel, and Jezebel was supposed to be the queen, and, the, and they were killing people left and right, not only uh, with the sword of the hand, but the sword of the mouth, false prophecy, kind of where we're at today, right, in the world. So we see all this happening, but we see all of a sudden God infused to the situation a true man of God, and he's willing to sacrifice his life, if need be, to step before the king and call a drought. Amen. In, in the reading, if you read about Elijah, it's often said uh, by Ahab that Elijah was the man that troubleth Israel, that troubles the church, or the false church in this case. Um, then I, I want to, again, apply some of this wording. First, we see in one, no dew, no rain. Of course, no dew or rain would cause a drought, and that's where the outline comes from, Elijah's drought. Knowing that Elijah didn't cause a drought, but as we read in Deuteronomy, God had already said if Israel turned and started worshiping other gods, which they did under Ahab uh, and Jezebel, that he would cause the drought. Um, all the man of God did was quote scripture to the king and the queen. So when we get down to uh, verse 3, get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith. And we remember the definition of brook Cherith is to cut off or to cut down. In this case, what are we doing? We're cutting down false doctrine. We're cutting off with the word of God, that thing that's coming from the, the king and the queen that's taking the people away from God. That's our job. We got to cut those things off. That's bad water, not good water. So, and then we get Jordan again. 
In Jordan, the definition is a boundary or a crossing point. So we're setting a boundary and then we're making a point for God's people to cross over. Where to? Cross over to the fertile land. Cross over to the land that's with milk and honey. Cross over how? Through the word of God. Amen? That's our job, to provide a crossing for those people that are lost and to put a boundary up against the false things that will come against the gospel of Christ. Amen? That's why we're kicking those definitions into there so you can see that. Then we go down to four, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens. That's that word, ravens again. We see it also in verse six, and the ravens bought him bread and flesh in the morning. That can be translated either birds, if you want the miracle of the birds, or it can be translated as the Arabs, like I said, Ishmael's seed. I'm going to give you that as we continue to go. Then I want you to jump over to uh, eight. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, already he's saying the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord. One question before we keep moving on. Today, where do we get the word of the Lord from? The Bible on the bleacher seat. we got to know the Bible to know the word of the Lord. That's what these prophets knew, the word of the Lord. You can't get the word of the Lord. Don't trust all these people out here saying, God told me this or God told me that. You better apply what God told them to the Bible before you start following them, or they're going to lead you just like Ahab and Jezebel led them away from God instead of to God. So we get to nine. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, and belong to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. The widow woman right next to it equals the church. Who sustains the people of God spiritually? Whose role? The church. They're supposed, to, they're supposed to sustain us. The son of the widow woman equals the fruits of the church. So if you'll take and put son and then equals fruit of the church, we'll have better understanding. But again, let's look at that word Zarephath there in 10. Zarephath means smelting or a workshop for refining. So what is he doing? He's refining the prophet here in verse 10, under the conditions of the drought. We're going to be refined. Remember, in these days, there's a drought of what? Of speaking the truth, speaking the word of God, understanding the truth. There's a, tr there's a drought there. So a man coming up, and I'm just going to pick on Derek, my son. As a young man, if he doesn't have a resource, if he doesn't have a prophet that's speaking from the book, then where is he going to get his truth? from the world or from the false church, from Ahab, from Jezebel, and he's going to be in 100% in the church, working for the church, trying to move what these people are saying, and it's going to be the wrong thing. So what does God have to do? He's got to take him to this place of refinement. He's got the right heart. He's got the right mind, but it has to be refined now by the word of God and not the word of man. Amen? So I want to give you those words as we read it, and we've already covered it. So we see Elijah going through all this. Down in verse 12, I want to give you something else. He's giving you, the woman is doing what she's supposed to do, the woman equaling the church. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel. That's all the church has now. They don't have a lot of truth. Why? Because these men and women that are leading these places, these churches are preaching what their fathers taught them. Jesus said it this way. You're more concerned with the traditions of your fathers than you are the word of God. That's what he said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leader of the church way back then. We've gone 2,000 years since that. You don't think we're still dealing with the traditions of the fathers? We are. So there's only a little word in the church. This woman only has a little bit. But she's willing to give the little bit that she has to the man of God, right? And then we call that what? What does she give? What do we call that spiritually? First fruits. First fruits. Thank you. First fruits. So when you see verse 12, she's giving first fruits. That's what we're supposed to do. As men and women of God, we should be giving first fruits, our first energy, our first effort, the things that God has blessed us. We should be giving them to God, give them back some way to God. Help someone. 
reach down and help someone that doesn't have truth. Amen. She gives it to him. And then she says, uh, I am, in the middle of verse 12, I am gathering two sticks that I may go and dress it for me and my son. God can take your two sticks, just like he took the fish from the little boy and multiply it. Now, if all I have is two sticks, then I got two sticks. But if I, if I present those two sticks in a way that I'm trying to glorify God, God will multiply those two sticks. In this case, those two sticks represents the two houses of God. What are the two houses of God during this time? Israel and Judah, right? Gathering the two sticks, what? Gathering the people of God back. That's just showing you the spiritual representative of what's going on here. That I may go and dress it for me and my son that, that we may eat and die. Okay, so I just want you to understand those sticks, those sticks we're supposed to do, we're supposed to be, the church is supposed to be gathering those things that have left the church and don't have a way. So I'm just giving you that as we continue to increase our learning on what Elijah is doing. Verse 13, and Elijah said unto her, fear not, go and do thou as what thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first and bring it unto me and after make thee and thy son die. There, yours. So that's first fruits. Give me mine, and then the rest is yours. Give God. Seek the kingdom of God first, and everything will be given to you. Verse 14, for thus said the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of milk shall not waste, neither shall the course of oil until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. In other words, I got you. Don't worry about what it looks like. I'll multiply, just like the fish and the loaves of bread. I'll multiply whatever you have, as long as you give me first fruits. long as your heart and your mind is on me. Amen? 15, and she went and did according to saying of Elijah. She obeyed. We picked that up in, in Haggai. Obeying, they obeyed. And she and her house did eat many days. In our case, we're eating the bread of life and we're drinking in the spirit, right? In our case, 13, 16, and the barrel of milk wasted not, neither did the course of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he has spoke. And it won't fail for you and your house either, amen? As long as your source is right, as long as the source of what you're trying to do for the word of God, for the gospel of Christ is right, and your heart is right, and as Richard said earlier, you, you have the natural fear of God or reverence, fear, reverence, respect for God that you want to live a life to sow righteous seed in the earth. That's where we're moving to there. So let's pick it up in 17 and then I'll ask y'all what y'all see. Um, let's finish and see what Elijah is doing here. We see God refining uh, the church, which is the woman. We see God refining it. We see him setting up borders. We see him cutting off uh, this false doctrine or Ahab and Jezebel, which represents the false doctrine. We see with the Jordan River, he's setting boundaries and crossing points for spiritual renewal, rebirth, and setting up for salvation. We'll see the setting up for salvation with the son, as Derek reads us, uh, 1 Kings 17, 17 through 24. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I done with thee, O thou man of God? Are thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried her into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that thy word of the Lord and thy mouth is truth. 
Amen. The word of the Lord in thy mouth is true or truth, right? All right, we all see. What stands out there, 17 through 24? Anything stands out to you? There's, uh, there's two things for me. Um, the first being in verse 17. Uh, and it says that the that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house. So we're building it upon we read in Haggai, right? Like this woman is a mistress, so she doesn't belong in this house. So she can't identify um, in the house being physically there, but spiritually being of God, right? She fell mm -hmm. sick and his, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And when you understand like the breath being the spirit, then that person again, right? That person had nothing of God left in him. Mm -hmm. um, so they're just just vacant, right? And that was because if you go back up and read and understand, like the woman, she just didn't have any nourishment from her, right? Um, but the second thing was in verse 24, where it says, <clears throat> And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Um, and I mean, I guess it's 22 through 24, but this whole little section where he he cries out to God and asks the soul to come back into him, right? Um, mm -hmm. And just the fact that it's showing the action is what brought her to the truth, right? To understand. And we've talked about this plenty of times about how so many times just how we live our life and what we do mm -hmm. um, is a greater testimony than sometimes just preaching to someone because they get to experience it and see um a man or a woman of god that are actually living it and not just practicing through lip service so Amen. that was pretty neat good job good job Derek. richard you got anything yes uh it, it kind of build up on what you said earlier and it said that, and, and what Derek is already saying is that as Elijah uh, laid up on the sun on the, and, and, and he told, uh, cried out to, to God for the soul to come back to him. Uh, and as we understood earlier, where he said, uh, the sun equal the, the fruit of the church. So the fruit is coming back mm -hmm. to the church. And this is when the, when the word, when God is involved and the word is, and, and, and uh, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, and uh, it was like the, the, the fruit, the fruit came back to the, to the remnant. Yeah. <laughs> and the remnant was able to, to continue. Good, very good, yeah. Everybody's putting it together. I love the way that it's coming together spiritually. Both of y'all, very good. Did you see, did you got anything? All right. Very good, everybody. But I, I, I want to get a couple of things here. Y'all left a little bit of meat on the bone. Sometimes y'all don't leave any, and I know I have a have, bad habit of doing the same, but y'all left a little bit on there. Verse 20, and he cried unto the Lord. When's the last time you cried to the Lord? I'm just asking that. I don't want an answer. I, I'm asking us, so we'll ask ourselves. I've heard a lot of complaining in my life to the Lord, but I haven't really heard a lot of crying to the Lord, right? Not for just myself and the condition of myself, but for someone else in the church or, or, or just the condition of the church. I just want to put that out there. And then, oh, Lord, my God, has thou also bought evil upon the widow? with whom I sojourned by slaying her. I, I want you to take time when you get a chance to look at the prophets of God all through the Bible. They always ask God a question in reference to who he is and the actions that are happening in the flesh. They always go back and pose to God a question. And the, the question I would, I'm going to summarize is this. How does this circumstance and situation glorify you? Right? It's not always about me, but how is this circumstance or situation going to look 
as it reflects on God, because now a man of God has been sustained in the wilderness through all these things, through his refining by this widow. Remember the widow. A widow does not have a husband or she's lost her husband. In this case, the widow is the church being absent of Jesus Christ. Okay? So now we have to look at it from that perspective. She, even though she was absent, like you said, Richard of the Spirit and Derek, she still got a little bit in her, but she didn't have enough for her son, so she, the Spirit didn't go from her to her son, and he dies. So now we're trying to restore the son, so now the next generation, right? The next generation, I'll say it again, will have something to build a foundation from. If we don't transfer the truth to that generation or the spirit to that generation or the spirit to that, or the fear of God to that generation, how are they gonna have it? In this case, the prophet supersedes and comes in and stretches himself. We, we see him mimicking the spirit of God and. When God came to the earth and he saw it was dark without war, he, he spread his spirit over the earth. We see that in Genesis. And when the spirit of God is spread over something, it brings life to that thing. In this case, you're the prophets. You're the, the elect. You're the people that are supposed to be spreading that spirit over those things that otherwise would be dead. I'm going to give you that in verse 20. In 21, where he stretched himself over, I think Richard picked that up a little bit. So let's solidify what we're saying. People say, well, I'm afraid, where, where do you get that from? That's one reading, that's your interpretation. So let's see what Ezekiel, let's go to another prophet and see what Ezekiel says. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. I've heard people teach on this, but now that we have an understanding about the prophet and what God's calling the prophet to do, Let's see what Ezekiel is doing here, or God's calling Ezekiel to do. And Ezekiel 37, 1, 1 through 14, so we can have understanding. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valleys, which is full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were many, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry, bone, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I behold, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus said the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet as uh, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus said the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of, the, out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I, op when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, said the Lord. Amen. What do you all see there? Dry bones, another issue. This time, instead of 
just the son of the widow, being the widow being the church, the church being Israel, or the men and women of God, we got a whole valley of sons and daughters that have been dead so long, the bones are already dry. A whole valley. What's it saying to y'all there? That there's no truth. Hmm. Nothing to drink. Until, huh? no water. until you give people truth, people aren't going to live again. Are these people dealing with the drought too? They sure were. Hmm. What did you see? You got anything? They won't get it if we don't get it to them. Very good. Well, very well said. You, you are the prophet. You're the ones that got the word. So if you don't take the word, if all you do is keep it to yourself, again, we get a valley of dry bones. Richie, you got anything? Yes. Uh, yes, what it's saying to me is to build up on uh, what you already said is that there was a drought, there was no word. Uh, the people had been uh, so long without the word. And then uh, uh, verse 12, it said, therefore prophesy and say unto them, thus say the Lord, behold my people, and uh, I, will open your, I will open your grave and cause you to come out uh, of your grave and bring you into the land. So it, to me, it's telling us, telling me that we have a responsibility mm. uh, as we learn the word and as we start to, 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 to get understanding, then we have to prophesy to the dead, to, to those bones, mm -hmm. to those desolate, in, those, in those desolate places. And so that they have an opportunity to hear the word. And then, and, and as we start to prophesy, you know, then God can do his part, but it's our responsibility at this point in time because he is equipping us to go into those desolate places. And that can be work, that can be in the gym, that could be wherever. And when we prophesy and we had, and, and he bring them to us and we prophesy and we do the work, then he can, he can take his part and bring them, pull them out of the desolate place. And then he can, the, the, the breath of the, uh, the spirit can enter back and have an opportunity to enter back into them. Yeah. And first we see, even before the son, we don't hear what the son has to say because he's the son uh, of the widow woman, but we even hear her confess that this is a man of God, right? We, we need to be putting ourselves in, in positions to help people understand the word of God, to take the word of God to, to the people so they can confess the same confession about us. This is a woman of God. This is truly a man of God. I was dead. And what he said to me brought the spirit of God back into me. Amen. Because I can't say nothing of myself, but if I say it from the word of God, it has power to move. Amen. Y'all did really well with that. So y'all don't leave me a lot of meat on the bone, but I want to cover a couple of things. Again, we don't do anything, as we just said here, but in verse 5, God does everything. Thus said the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. But who triggers God? We do. The men and women of God. But Ezekiel. Ezekiel triggers God. By what? The word of God. The promises he's already given us. Quit praying for all these other things. Learn the word of God and pray to the word of God through the promises of God. Now you have power and authority and you have power to move things. We're going to see that God willing here. Jesus telling the church that. But we, if we tell the church, you don't have to learn the Old Testament. You don't have to learn what the prophet said. All you got to understand is Jesus died for your sins and, and, and you're good. Yeah, you're good. You're good to sit in the church and wait to be raptured. And on the day of the Lord, the terrible day of the Lord, you're going to still be sitting there in the church waiting to be raptured. 
So we have to understand that God does it, but we have to move him to do it by speaking the word. Amen? And then nine. Then said unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy. That wind in the Hebrew is ruha, spirit. And we'll see those again in the book of Revelation, the four winds that go across the earth. We understand that's the spirit of God, and that's the spoken word. When we speak it, God moves, but we have to speak it, and we got to know it to speak it. Amen? Jesus spoke the word. It is written. It is written. It is written. Right? You make my father's commandments of null and void by your traditions of your fathers. In other words, go back to the law of God, and they'll have power. But you have no power, you Pharisees and Sadducees, because you're, you're speaking the traditions of your father and still the word of God. Jesus speaking. All right, let's continue to certify that. Oh, we got a minute. Let's go to Job, Job another prophet. Bible says to study the prophets. If I can find it. Job. Well, let's go to Job 5, 17 through 27. Job 5, 5, 17 through 27. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. For he maketh sore and bindeth up, he woundeth and his hands make whole. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven there shall no evil touch thee. In famine he shall redeem thee from death, and in war from the power of the sword. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue, neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh. Neither shall thou be afraid of beasts of the earth, for thou shalt be in the league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with thee. And thou shalt know that thy tabernacle shall be in peace, and thou shalt visit thy habitation, and shalt not sin. Thou shalt also know that thy seed shall be great, and thine offspring as the grass of the earth. Then shall come to thy grave in a full age, like as a shock of corn cometh in its season. Lo, this we have searched it, so it is. Hear it, and know thou, and know thou it for thy good. All right. Again, here we see in Job him speaking. He's talking to the men and women of God. He's talking to those who know the word, the elect, those who have truth in that time. What we call them in today's church saints, or those who have been separated out or sanctified for a purpose. And we've not been sanctified by baptism. We've been brought out of sin through baptism, and we've been saved. But now there's something that we have to do. Study to show thyself approved, right? Study to show thyself. Even the prophet, we see him going to being sent by God to Zarephath for what? To be refined, right? The workshop of refining. So every day God's refining me. So don't think as it read that they're read to us because God's refining us. He says here, behold is the man whom God corrected. That's refining. Verse 17. That's being in Zarephath. Don't, don't get all shooken. Don't get all weak need because you're in a position of refining. God is getting your faith where it needs to be for you to work the miracles that he wants you to work. Amen. If your faith is not tested, then it's going to be weak. As Richard spoke of the gym, if you don't go to the gym and, and push weight against your, your body, you're never going to be able to resist that weight that's coming against your body. You have to build up your strength. Spiritually, he's building up our strength here. 19, he shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven. We got to remember the seven troubles are the seven different civilizations that the men and women of God will go through. Amen? And we can go back and talk about them. They're going to take a long time to talk about, but that's back when we talk about Egypt and, and uh, 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 the people that came against the God, the Assyrian Empire, uh, the Babylonian Empire, Middle Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, uh, the Roman Empire, 
those those are the seven troubles of the world. We spoke about the seven, and then the Bible says, yea, eighth. The eighth, we don't have to worry about trouble because that's going to be the millennial kingdom, and Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. So we shouldn't have trouble there. We just only have choice. Well, we see seven here. And there shall no evil touch me. Why? Because I have a mind of Christ. Because I have the word stored up in me. When there's drought, I have the word. I have water. So I'll never go thirsty. My leaves will always be green. Meaning if my leaves are green, I should bear fruit. That's why God uh, gives us Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem, looking at the fig tree, seeing green tree, green leaves, but were there any fruit on it? Was there any fruit on the fig tree? No. No. And what did he do to the fig tree? He cursed it. Right? And it dried up from the root up. Again, that's what's happening with the church today. So then we get to 20. And famine, he shall be redeemed. Famine, pestilence, uh, drought. Right? And in war from the power of the sword. War, not physical war, spiritual war. Every day, war. We're dealing with war. Thou shall be hid from the surge of the tongue. Neither shall thou be afraid of destruction when it comes. 22, at destruction and famine thou shall laugh. Neither shall thou be afraid of the beast of the earth. Don't have to be. The beast are those Men and women that we see every day that are infected by a spirit that is not of God, those are the beasts. They devour men. They take us away from living a sinless life. Amen? Richard, I mean, you talked about that the other day, uh, what we have to deal with at work, what we have to deal with at the gym. Those are the beasts here. You don't have to worry about them if you have the word of God in you. Then he's going to pick that up here at 23. For thou shalt be in a league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with thee. Right? We don't have to deal with them. They're going to come to you if they know you're a man of God. If anything, the fact that you're walking in the Spirit is going to reflect them. Amen? They're going to take a wide berth around you. 24, and thou shalt know that thy tabernacle shall be in peace. What is my tabernacle? This flesh that I have on. Right? My, my spirit is walking in this flesh, and all you see is this flesh, but inside this flesh is the ruha that God put in it, the breath that he gave me, which is the spirit of God. So I'm going to be at peace, and thou shalt visit thy habitation and shall not sin. I can be in this flesh and not sin. Quit letting people tell you just because you're still in the flesh, you have, to, you, you have to sin. You don't. Jesus gave us, as an example, a man in the flesh walking with a God, spirit of God in him, that didn't sin. If he had a sin, he couldn't have been our sacrifice. We know he was our sacrifice. He said he kept all his commandments of, of his father. So he didn't sin. It's possible. 25, thou shalt know also that thy seed shall be great, thine offspring as the grass of the earth. Our seed. The widow woman had a son. Isn't that her seed? Elijah covered him, or the spirit that was in Elijah covered him from head to toe. That's why. We can go back and we can see a lot of the prophets. I can give you some verses here of other prophets that did the same. Even Jesus did the same with a widow woman in the New Testament and bought her son back, her only son. When his spirit covered her, him. 26. Thou shalt come to thy grave in full age like a, 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 shot, a shot of corn cometh in the season. Lo, this we have searched it, so it is. Hear it and know thou it for thy good. Everything about the word of God is for my good. That's why the men and women, when I, I saw a preacher this week uh, on, on, on YouTube, he was preaching to a group of transgender people, the word of God, and you would have swore he was cussing them out. They called the police on him, and the police walked up to them, and you would have swore this guy had just robbed an old person or something, the way the police treated him. And he has, I mean, the last time I looked in America, we have freedom of speech. If they can say what they want to say against the word of God, do I not have the ability to say what the word of God says? When did that law change? And now we're even gotten to the point where they attempt to cite a, a man of God for hate speech? For speaking the word of God? 
the don't think this generation that's coming after us is not going to be just like the generation in the Bible, even in the New Testament. They threw them in jail. They persecuted them. They stoned them for what? Speaking the word of God. We're already starting to call it hate speech in America. Just saying to you, so you can have understanding. Let's look at what Jesus said in Luke real quick. I know we're running out of time here. Real fast, let's go to Luke 10, 17 to 24. Luke 10, 17 to 24. Luke 10, verse 17 to 24. And the seventy return again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and whom and to and he to whom the Son will, will reveal him. And he turned him into his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Don't know the word. Call themselves men and women of God. Don't get this twisted. He's not talking about the prophets that are written in this book. He's talking about the false prophets. Remember, Jezebel had 400 false prophets, right? We're talking about Ahab and Jezebel, 400, that never saw the things that he's speaking to his disciples about. In this case, it was the 70. Remember, the 12 were sent out to Israel. The 70 were sent out to the Gentiles. We picked that up in the, in the beginning of the trees Bible study. So he's saying, you are blessed because you understand the word of God. The spirit has revealed this to you. And you're blessed because you know it and you're walking in it, you're working in it, you're being set aside. So much so that your book, your name is written in the book of life. You won't have the second death. But again, there's work to do. So I'll ask you all in closing, we're going to end up with a third one, Derek, but I'll ask you in closing, what do you see here that uh, Luke is referencing in reference to what Jesus is saying to the disciples, to you and me? Anything stand out? All right, let me cover just for the sake of time. If y'all have anything after I cover, I'll ask you before we close and pray. 17, and the 70 returned again. They had went out just like Jesus had instructed them, and they took the word out to the people. And this time, Satan was already in the world. His disciples were already in the world. The churches were already corrupt. Remember, way back when, we already read Ahab, and Jezebel was already corrupting the churches. And they're happy because now even the devils are subject unto him. Did he, does it say devil or devils? With an S. Spirits everywhere. Got a bunch of devils in the world today. 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as light and fall from heaven. He's telling you what the issue is on the earth. Where is Satan at now? If he fell from heaven, where is he at? On earth. Woe to you on the earth. Remember, Satan has come down with great wrath looking to whom he may devour, right? 19, behold, I gave unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. These serpents, these scorpions, they're, they're spirits, and God is just describing the characteristics of these spirits. They work against you like scorpions and serpents. They're cunning, 
they're spitting venom at you. They're stinging you with false doctrine. They're paralyzing you. They're capturing. They're sucking all the spirit of God out of you. And you end up dead, just like the widow's son. These are characteristics he's given us of the spirits from Satan that are on the earth. 20, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. They have to obey me. When God, when Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, he didn't have no choice. They have to get behind them. Right? We, they have to obey me if I'm speaking the word of God, but I have to know the word of God to speak it. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven, where it said your books are written, your name is written in the book of life. That's the beautiful thing about being a servant for God. You don't have the second death has no power on you. 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. In other words, do you rejoice in the flesh? No. He's rejoicing in the spirit to get us to understand our, our happiness, our joy does not come in this flesh. He wasn't going to rejoice in the flesh because he knew he was going to have to give up the flesh on the cross. I can't rejoice in this flesh because I have to be willing to give up this flesh on whatever cross is before me. If it's same-sex marriage, if it's abortion, if it's adultery, if it's whatever sin that I come against that caused men to put me to death, I'm going to still rejoice in the spirit because I know that I don't. the second death has no power on me. So he says, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. What are you when are you born again? You're new. You're a babe in Christ. He's talking about those people that are born again. Even so, Father, for so it seems good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. The Son is the whole book, which we call the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. In the beginning was what? was the Word, and the Word became flesh. That's how he reveals God to me, through the Word, the book. And we've taken the book out of the church, and we throw it in the back of the car, and we throw it, we can't even find it when we go to church. If we go to church on the Sabbath, most of us don't even go to church on the Fourth Commandment, but that's another story. I'll get off my soapbox. 23, and he turned to him unto his disciples, and to me and you. And said privately, blessed are the eyes which see all things that ye see. Truth, right? You're truly a man of God, the church said, the widow lady said. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see these things which ye see and have not seen them. Thanks for out, baby. And to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Why haven't they seen them and heard them? Because the church ain't doing its job. Yeah. The church just has a little cornmeal and a little oil, and it's saving it for who? Their self. Just a little cornmeal, a little oil. Back to First Kings, back to Elijah. So we have to put that word, that oil, that cornmeal out as the men and women of God. We're going to pick this up again. We're not finished. we gotta, we got to pick up verse 18, 19 chapter 18, 19, and part of 20, and then we'll be done. But thank you for the word. Thank you for your time. Thank you for visiting with us today in the word of God. Father God, we just thank you that you are God and that your truth goes out and does not come back void. Lord, help us to know your word and help us to utilize your word to change the world, Lord, as you would have it back to paradise, back to the garden, back to uh, the place that... Uh, Sin has cut off, cut us off from in the flesh. But uh, we know that you've made a way where there seems to be no way through your word, through your son, and through your spirit, Lord. Help us to hearken to the spirit, Lord, and help us to hear the spirit. And help us to turn off some of the things in the world so that we can have access to the things in the spirit and we can be attentive to the things in the spirit in the direction you would have us to go, Lord. As it is written, help us to do, Lord. And these things we pray in your name, Jesus, forever and ever. Amen.